Welcome to tonight's first event in the National Humanities Center new virtual book club series. I'm Robert Newman, president and director of the center, and it's my privilege to serve as the host for this evening's event. First of all, I wanna thank all of you for joining us tonight. This online environment is certainly a new way of interacting for many of us, but in the midst of all that's happening, I think we all welcome the chance to connect with others, to take a break from the news, and to share a conversation about literature and the ways it can speak to us across vast dist distances and periods of time. Before I introduce this evening's guest author, Joseph Lutzi, I want to note that while you'll only hear our two voices tonight, we all will be in conversation through the comments section below the video. Please use the comments section to pose your questions or to offer your thoughts. I'll be monitoring that part of the conversation and will bring your questions to Joseph's attention. I'd also encourage you to respond to one another. We are being joined by participants from across the country, and this is a wonderful opportunity to interact with others who share your interests. Our guest this evening is Joseph Lutzi, Professor of Comparative Literature at Bard College. Professor Lutzi is the award-winning author, teacher, and scholar whose scholarly work encompasses Dante, Renaissance Florence, comparative European literature, and Italian cinema. His most recent books include My Two Italys, in which he explores Italian-Americans' relationship with their ancestral country, and In a Dark Wood, the book he'll be discussing with us this evening. Besides his book-length publications, Joseph's essays and reviews have appeared in the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, the Chronicle of Higher Education, the Los Angeles Review of Books, the Times Literary Supplement, American Scholar, and many other publications for both scholarly and public audiences. He has received fellowships in support of his work from the Harvard Center for Italian Renaissance Studies, the Whitney Humanities Center at Yale, and the National Humanities Center. As a fellow at the National Humanities Center in 2004-2005, Joseph spent what he has described as an idyllic year working on his book on Italian cinema and enjoying life in Durham, North Carolina with his wife-to-be, Catherine. Yet, only a couple of years later, tragedy struck. And Joseph, Joseph's beautiful memoir, In a Dark Wood, reveals how he coped with that sudden loss and life-changing event. Joseph's story speaks powerfully to the ways the humanities provide solace and perspective for confronting life's challenges, and we could not think of a more appropriate book or guest for the first installment of our virtual book series. Thank you for joining us tonight, Joseph Lutzi. Bear with us. We've lost connection with Professor Lutzi. He'll be back in a moment. Well, while we're waiting for Professor Lutzi, I'll try to entertain you with a poem. This is a poem by Dean Rader called Frost on Fire. Something that melts can also burn like a thicket of ice in the pond the cold knit of stars, even the hard white axe of the heart. A man can freeze without getting wet, just as he can lose without being lost. But winter finds everyone, even though we spend our whole lives eluding it. Frost reminds us of what is to come, the snow, the sky, the trees, the skin, the sleet, the sleep. How often have I woken in fear, blind in my unknowing? The woods are dark and deep, even in the day. Still, the mind will find its way into the light, into the bright thaw of this life, where we, both flake and flame, fire and fall through. That sun days, that night show day, how to blaze, that death drop its name. Yes, we have you, Joe. Good, you're okay, back. Okay, great. Okay, 
Good. Thank you, you saved me from reading lots and lots of poems. Well, you probably do a better job than I'm about to do. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, so um, I am turning things over to you. Um, uh, let me just refresh everyone's memory. Uh, our guest this evening is Joseph Lutzi, who is a professor of comparative literature at Bard College. And Professor Lutzi is an award-winning author, teacher, and scholar, whose scholarly work encompasses Dante, Renaissance Florence, comparative European literature, and Italian cinema. And his most recent books include My Two Italys, in which he explores Italian-Americans' relationship with their ancestral country, and In a Dark Wood, the book he will be discussing with us this evening. So, Joe, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Robert. Thank you. And thank you all for your patience. I was just thinking as I went through this ordeal of trying to get back online that, you know, what part of Dante's hell is reserved for bad internet connection? <laughs> uh, it's probably one we can all relate to these days as our life has moved online. Um, so thank, first of all, it's an incredible honor and pleasure to be here. Um, I'm, I'm a former fellow of the National Humanities Center, and it was you know, one of the most important years of my life as a, um, I guess I could say I was a young scholar at the time. This was in 2004, 2005. And I was working on a book on uh, poetry and, I'm sorry, cinema and its relation to the other arts, especially poetry. And the, I got a lot of work done that year, but what I really took from it is the incredible sense of camaraderie and intellectual joy. There's no other word for it that I felt every day when I came to the center and, you know, um, had lunch with the fellows and just was part of this incredible community. Uh, it's, it's something I think about all the time. So it's especially meaningful to be back here to talk about a very personal book that I wrote um, after my time as a fellow. So after my fellowship in 2004-05, I... Um, you know, I was at, uh, at the early stages of my academic career, and I, I loved the research and the scholarship, and I was plowing ahead with, you know, my academic projects. Um, and then you know, my life took an unexpected turn that uh, really led to a new kind of writing for me. Um, not that I, I still continue to do the scholarship, but because of this event, I decided to kind of open up my writing to non-scholars and to try and talk about what we do as academics, but in a way that touches other people. That won't really make sense until I read a little bit from the book, just to describe what that event was. So now what I'll do is just take a brief detour and read to you a passage or two from um, my book, In a Dark Wood. Uh, what Dante taught me about grief, healing, and the mysteries of love. I'm just going to really read um, very briefly from the beginning. And I'll start with the epigraph. Um, the epigraph of the, story, of the book is, every grief story is a love story. And that's a rhyme in a way with a book by Julian Barnes, um, who wrote a book, um, Levels of Life, a very beautiful memoir of, of grief, the loss of his wife, where he said, every love story is a grief story. And I kind of reversed it because my experience was that um, it was really the other way around, that the experience of grief led to love uh, unexpectedly um, and not just romantic love, but, you know, kind of more cosmic understanding of the term that that I got from the hero of this book, which is not, who is not Joe Luzzi, but is Dante Alighieri. So I'll read to you from, from the beginning, okay? Um, Nel mezzo del camin di nostra vita mi ritrovai per una selva oscura. In the middle of our life's journey, I found myself in a dark wood. So begins one of the most celebrated and challenging poems ever written, Dante's Divine Comedy, a 14,000-line epic about the soul's journey through the afterlife. The tension between the pronouns says it all. Although the I belongs to Dante, who died in 1321, his journey is also part of our life. We will all find ourselves in a dark wood one day, the lines suggest. For me, that day came 
eight years ago in the book now, uh, much more than that, but I'll just follow the book. For me, that day came eight years ago on November 29th, 2007, a morning just like any other. I left my home in upstate New York at 8.30 a.m. and drove to nearby Bard College, where I'm a professor of Italian. It was cold and wet, the air barely creased by the gray light. After my first class ended, I walked to my office to gather materials and then made my way to a 10.30 a.m. class. I was joking with my students as we all settled in when I noticed something unusual out of the corner of my eye. There was a security guard standing at the door. Look, they're coming to arrest me, I said, laughing. But the beefy security guard was not smiling. Are you Professor Luzzi? I've done nothing wrong was my first thought after he spoke. Yes, I said, why? Please come with me. I edged outside the classroom and saw the associate dean and vice president of the college racing up the stairwell. I started running too, down the stairs and out of the building. There was a security van waiting for me. Joe, your wife's had a terrible accident. These words came from somewhere close, but they sounded muffled as though passing through dimensions. Time and space were bending around me. I was entering the dark wood. Earlier that morning at 9.15, my wife, Catherine Lynn Mester, pulled out of a gas station and into oncoming traffic, just eight miles from where I sat proctoring an exam in Italian. As close as she was, I didn't hear the crunching blow of the oncoming van into the soft aluminum pocket of her driver's side door nor did I see the careening skid of her Jeep as it swerved across the country highway and finally came to a full stop, 20 feet from impact on the other side of the road. In the monastery-like silence of my classroom, I was unaware of the surging convoy of emergency response vehicles that were barreling up Route 9G, ready to rescue my wife from the tangle of metal and speed her to Poughkeepsie St. Francis Hospital a half hour away. Those emergency responders were not just carrying my wife. Catherine was eight and a half months pregnant with our first child. Soon after the security guard had appeared at my 1030 class, a medical team performed an emergency cesarean on an unconscious Catherine, delivering our daughter Isabel, who was limp, pale, had no respiratory effort, and whose heart rate was inaudible. The doctors applied pressure ventilation by bag and mask, but one minute into her new life, Isabel's heart rate was still slow and she had to be intubated. Slowly, her heart rate rallied. Within 10 minutes, she was taking her first involuntary spontaneous breaths. 45 minutes after Isabel was born, Catherine died. I had left the house at 8.30. By noon, I was a widower and a father. A week later, I found myself standing in the cold rain in a cemetery outside of Detroit, watching as my wife's body was returned to the earth close to where she was born. The words for the emotions I had known until then, pain, sadness, suffering, no longer made sense as a feeling of cosmic paralyzing sorrow washed over me. My personal loss felt almost beside the point. A young woman who had been vibrant with life was now no more. I could feel part of me going down with Catherine's coffin. It was the last communion I had ever had, I would ever have with her. And I have never felt so unbearably connected to the rhythms of the universe. But I was on forbidden ground. Like all other mortals, I would have to return to the planet Earth of grief. An hour with the angels is about all we can take. Days afterward, I went walking for a walk in the village where Catherine and I had been living in upstate New York. By chance, I ran into a neighbor who was also out walking, the chaplain who had officiated in my college's memorial service for Catherine. You're in hell, she said to me. I immediately thought of Dante, the author I had devoted much of my career to teaching and writing about. After a charmed youth as a leading poet and politician in Florence, the city where he was born in 1265, Dante Alighieri was sentenced to exile while on a diplomatic mission. In those first years, he wandered around the region of Tuscany, desperately seeking to return to his beloved city. He met with fellow exiles, plotted his return, 
connive with former enemies, anything to get home, but he never set foot in Florence again. His words on the experience would become a mantra to me. Tu lascerai ogni cosa più diletto, e questo è quello strale che l'arco dello esilio pria saeta. You will leave behind everything you love most dearly, and this is the arrow, the bow of exile, first let's fly. These words from Dante captured like nothing else the years I struggled to find my own way out of the dark wood of grief and mourning. And yet it was only because of his exile that Dante was able to write the Divine Comedy when he accepted once and for all he would never return to Florence. Before 1302, the year he was expelled, he had been a fine lyric poet and an impressive scholar, but he had yet to find his voice. Only in exile did he gain the heaven's eye view of human life, detached from all earthly allegiances that enabled him to speak of the soul. So um, thank you for listening. Uh, the, that's the opening of the book. And I think you can see why, you know, uh, I had to read that to give you a sense of the turning point event that kind of led me to this book and led me to um, think about my scholarship in new ways and think about that going back to that idea of conversation that was so important while I was a fellow at the National Humanities Center um, to kind of create a new conversation based on um, the work that we do as scholars and thinkers, as teachers and writers. And my experience with this book was kind of, it never came to me in, in concrete terms like, okay, you've had this terrible tragic situation you know my wife Catherine was with me when I was a fellow at the National Humanities Center many people in the community got to know her and love her um it's not like at that point I said well you know I really should write a book about it and start writing in a non-academic way it happened invisibly and gradually and at a certain point after the accident, I would say, you know, four or five years had passed. I realized I was at that point where it was close enough to what happened where it still felt visceral and raw and I could remember all of it. And yet I did have some distance on it. You know, it had been four or five, you know, four years had passed. So I felt that was the time to kind of try and get this, um, this story down. And it happened concurrently with this idea to also write about my family uh, experience. I wrote, as Robert mentioned, a book called My Two Italys, which is about um, my life as a scholar of Italian, Italian studies, who had spent a lot of time in Florence, in the North, who had, you know, had a much different experience of Italy than my parents who were poor immigrants from the South. My parents and four older uh, brothers and sisters were born in Italy, uh, you know, in a house with dirt floors, the bathroom was outside. I mean, really intense poverty. And they came to the United States in the 1950s, um, late 1950s, and I was born a decade later. So it was almost like two families my younger sister and I were born in the United States. And then we had this kind of mythic Italian family that was, you know, had this whole other set of experiences. And I had gone on to get a PhD in Italian literature. So their culture was a big part of me, but it was completely different from their world. So I decided to, you know, I said, when this accident happened, I started to rethink about my experiences as a scholar and say, well, you know, you could also write about your experience of Italy in a way that tells a story, in a way that, you know, conveys the immigrant experience, in a way that talks about what I consider to be an American story. You know, your family comes from a completely different part of the world. You grow up in a bilingual home and suddenly you're, you know, 100% American. How does that happen? What's the magical alchemy of that process? Um, this all started to happen after uh, the accident, after Catherine's death. So I did end up writing my two Italy's. And once that was done, I thought, okay, now's the time to write this book. Now's the time to write in a dark wood. I, I really felt like, as, as my first editor, um, Jonathan Galassi at Farrar Strauss said to me, he said, you know, you should only write 
a book that is necessary. And I think that was incredible advice. I feel it as a scholar too. We should only really write those books that we have to write. I felt I had to tell this story about Catherine. I felt that, you know, standing there in that cemetery in Detroit, um, watching her body put to, to rest was this experience that was so ex- unusual. And, and um, I mean, people are, you know, we bury the dead all the time, but for that to have happened so suddenly at such a young age, um, I felt I had to bear witness to it and to kind of, out of homage, you know, reconstruct Catherine's life in a way, reconstruct the the love that we had shared. And so I decided to write the book and I had written my To Italy. So I thought, well, I know what to do. I know how to write a non-academic book. I'll just sit down and do this. And it was actually, it kind of flew out of me. I mean, it just, it was like I wrote it in an exhale, you know, one summer, just locked myself in my office and just wrote page after page after page. And I showed it to, you know, a very trusted reader. And um, we were sitting in a, in a restaurant and she said, um, she said, I, I said, well, what do you think? You know, we'd been talking about this book and everything. And, and she said, you know, I just, I don't see the people outside this window. I don't hear the traffic on the street. And I said, what do you mean? What are you talking about? She said, this book is so in your head. It's, it's it's too personal. I said, well, of course it's personal. I mean, it's the most personal thing, this terrible thing that happened. It has to be personal, doesn't it? And I didn't really understand what she was getting at until I took a step back and I realized I hadn't written that book for the reader. I had written it for myself. I had written it to get it down on paper and it, it, it wasn't to be read. So I took a step back and, um, you know, this reader that happened to be my, my agent said, why don't you write something else? You've always want, you know, what book have you been wanting to write? Take a step back and write something else. Give this one a rest. I said, you know, I've always wanted to write about Dante. It's been my, my guide throughout my academic career. I've been studying it ever since I was an undergraduate. I wrote my dissertation on Dante. You know, I teach Dante every year. It's, it's as, you know, um, in uh, Moby Dick, Melville uh, Ishmael says, the whale boat was my, my Yale College and my Harvard, something like that. My university was Dante. You know, I'd learned so much from him and I kept studying him every year. I said, let me write a general book on Dante. That makes perfect sense. So I took a step back and I wrote a, what I thought was the beginning of a book on Dante for general readers. And I showed it to her and um, she's like, wow, <laughs> this is even worse than the other one. I mean, at least the other one had feeling and verve. This one is just like inert. This is a like a stillborn book. And I knew exactly what she meant because as easy as, oddly enough, as much as the grief narrative poured out of me, this Dante book was like pulling teeth and I couldn't figure it out. So I said, great, now I have two failed books on my hand. So I said, let me just go back to teaching and, and let things sit and, you know, not, not push things for a while. And then I don't know how you feel, but my experience has been usually the best things in life happen when they're not planned and it's totally chance and serendipity. Um, so there I was with these two books that I was no longer going to write. Um, so I, I went back to my teaching and I was just sort of, you know, uh, going along uh, happily as an academic. And I got an invitation. I had been writing some reviews and essays. So I got an invitation from a, an editor saying, you know, I, I, I like your work. Why don't you send us something? And I said, sure. Uh, what would you like me to send? And she said, send us anything. What do you, you know, what are you working on? What are you interested in? I said, well, that's, that's an enticing invitation. Let me think about that. And then I took a step back and I thought about what I'd spent the last months on, probably a year. I said, I have spent a, a, about a year writing a grief memoir. I even had the title. It was called A Life After Death Experience. And then I've been writing this book on Dante. What if they really were the same book? And then it was that illumination that hit me. I said, that's it. It is the same book. After Catherine died, I wanted to be back in the classroom 
I took no time off from teaching. Um, I went back the next semester and I wanted to teach. And I wanted to teach the books that I loved. I wanted to, you know, Dante took on a whole new meaning for me. And I had been writing about him as a scholar. I'd been writing, you know, kind of more academic stuff. But for the first time, I really heard his voice after almost, you know, almost 30 years of reading him. There's this moment in Paradiso 25 where Dante um, realizes he's never going to get back to Italy. Um, he's never going to get back to Florence, excuse me. And he's been kind of accepted that intellectually, but you hear in Paradiso 25, um, he basically says, uh, se mai contenga che il poema sacro, right? Should it ever come to pass that this sacred poem, his comedy, to which heaven and earth have both set hand so that it has made me lean through many years, should overcome the cruelty that bars me from the fair sheepfold where I slept as a lamb. Then will I return at the font where I was baptized and take the laurel crown. And he was basically saying that, he, he described Florence in that line as the bello ville. You can even hear in the Italian, the kind of nurturing sounds, the fair sheepfold. I realized that the tragedy and trauma of the Divine Comedy was not the death of Beatrice. That was a tragic event for Dante, but they didn't have a relationship in our modern romantic understanding of the term. She was more his muse, and he really does mourn her death in an early book, The Vita Nuova. But by the time of the Divine Comedy, Beatrice has become something else, a kind of source of spiritual sustenance. What Dante mourned was Florence. He lost his city in 1302. He was exiled from Florence. And he spent the last 20 years of his life roaming around Italy, looking for a home, never got back to Florence. And I heard that kind of plaintive pain in Paradiso 25 of him yearning for this home he'll never have again. And that's how I felt. I felt like I had fallen through this trap door from what had been my life into this other life that I wanted nothing to do with. I wanted to go back to the, you know, the life I originally had. I felt exiled from that life. And Dante's language helped me understand it. You know, I read to you a passage from the very beginning um, where I said, um, where he basically says, you will leave behind everything you love most dearly. And this is the arrow, the bow of exile first lets fly. Those are the words that Dante's ancestor, Cacciaguida, says to him in Paradiso 17 when he predicts his exile. And he says to him, Tu proverai si come sa di sale, lo pane altrui. You will come to learn how salty is the taste of another man's bread. Which sounds like an amazing metaphor, right? But in truth, if you've been to Florence, you know they make their bread without salt and have done since the Middle Ages. So Dante was literally saying exile will taste bad. It will be salty, bitter. You know, it won't be the bread that you ate growing up in Florence. So the poem took on this totally new meaning for me. Um, I started to understand it in new ways, you know. Um, and I felt I wanted to write about it in a way that translated the scholarship into a living key. Just to give you an example, there's this really famous passage in Dante, Canto of Ulysses in Inferno 26. It's the canto that Primo Levi remembers in Auschwitz when he's on the brink of despair and it keeps him alive. It's this line by Ulysses where he basically says, you know, uh, consider your seed. You are not, not made to live as a brute, but to pursue virtue and knowledge, right? And Ulysses, Odysseus, the Greek character, does something strange in Dante. He gets back home to Ithaca, and then he wants to leave again. It's a complete kind of rewriting of the Greek epic. And scholars have argued for you know centuries over why Dante has this this unusual rewriting of the Odyssey, right? 
I mean, I could never write this in a scholarly piece, but I feel like I understand it now because I went back to my hometown. I went back to my version of Ithaca. We all have one, right? I went back to the town I grew up in. My family and my small town in Rhode Island where I grew up, this beautiful Italian family kind of took me in. My mom helped me raise my daughter, Isabel. Um, you know, they, they rescued me. And yet being back in this town was very bitter for me. What Dante understood is that once you leave a place, even if you go back to it, it's not the same place you left. And Odysseus slash Ulysses flees from Ithaca, I think because he understands a place has not just a spatial component, but a temporal component. 20 years later, his Ithaca was very different than the one he left. And I believe psychologically that's Dante's profound insight is that sometimes our hometown is no longer our hometown. That to me is a scholarly, you know, question that um, the poem, the experience of writing about Dante in this personal way opened up to me. Um, it wasn't an easy book to write and probably not for the reasons you would think. Um, one would think, well, you experience something awful like that. Why go back and relive it? In a way, reliving it kind of helped me get through it in the sense that it really feels like when I read this, it feels like something almost that happened in a different lifetime. Um, but, you know, when you write a memoir, you got to kind of leave it on the table. <laughs> you got you to, op- as a friend of mine said, you got to lift up the, the hood of the car and, and poke around the engine. And that's not easy to do because, you know, some of the things you don't want people to know about. And for me, the kind of, I started the book thinking it was going to be about my lost, uh, you know, the, the death of my late wife and the rebuilding my life afterwards. What I found was that it became something very different. It became a book about fatherhood. Uh, my daughter, Isabel, miraculously made it. She's an amazing, healthy 12-year-old girl now. And, you know, I've been given a second chance at family life. Um, but those first years with her were very hard. I was grieving uh, my wife's death, and I was not equipped to just take on fatherhood. So I, my family jumped in and did most of the heavy lifting while I was able to continue my work and my career. I was there for Isabel, but you know, the heavy lifting was not what I was doing, the, the intense parenting. And I was ashamed of that. And that was a, a, a source of real um, personal disgrace for me. I couldn't, dis- I couldn't put it in writing. So the book was blocked for about a year where it was just like, I felt like almost a politician saying the right things, but not the real story. And then finally, my, I said at one point, I said, well, I, sp- I spent as much time with my daughter as my work allowed. And my editor, an incredible, large-hearted Dante soul said, did you really? <laughs> what happened? Just tell the truth. And at that point, I had this understanding of memoir. It's like the arrow in the dark wood, right? You got to release it into the world. And once you release that story in the world, you're kind of liberated from it. Um, I told the story about my failures as a father, my shortcomings, my difficulties in embracing fatherhood, and how lucky I was to get a second chance at it as the book and the st- my story progressed. Um, but to me, that is the real the real story of the book. It's not about the loss of a spouse. It's about learning how to become a parent under extreme and demanding difficulties that are excusable. No one was going to question my, my you know, difficulties in embracing fatherhood, but um, it was a painful experience nonetheless. So I'll just close before I open it up to questions with a reading. Um, with what I consider a, a, a sort of scene of being reunited with my daughter towards the end of the book and um, how Dante kind of gave me the words to, um, to understand that. Dearest Isabel, it, I, it's the first 
time in the book, I directly address my daughter. Dearest Isabel, you know by now that I can't retrace those first steps of ours any more than a writer can take back his first words. Your life began in the glare of an emergency room, and our first days together found me staring at you through the bars of your crib. Exiled from the fatherhood I had always dreamed of, with no words to help me fathom our broken bond. But I hope you'll discover, as I have, that it's not what lands you in the dark wood that defines you, but what you do to make it out. Just as you can't understand the first words of a story until you've read the last ones. Incipit vita nova. Here begins the new life. When you read Dante, you'll see that these first words of his point all the way to his last ones. When he looked back on hell, purgatory, and heaven, just as I look back now on our time in the underworld. He had the courage to believe in love, no matter how much he suffered, how much horror he endured. And it's with love in all its mysteries, not God or justice or free will or hope, that Dante chooses to end his poem, a vision I hope with all my heart will one day be yours. And now I quote the last lines of the Divine Comedy and the last lines that Dante ever wrote. Già volgeva il mio desio e il velle, si come rota che ugualmente è mossa, l'amor che muove il sole e le altre stelle. Now my will and my desire were turned like a wheel in perfect motion by the love that moves the sun and all the stars. Thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you so much, Joe. That was just wonderful. Um, so we have a question. Sure. Uh, asking how you compare and contrast academic writing versus the personal nonfiction mode. At this point in my life, I can say I had some misconceptions about the transition early on. I thought it would essentially be um, a process of expository explanation of work that I had done as a scholar. And it, it's not. Uh, what you find immediately is that they're really two different rhetorical systems. Um, what we write as scholars, the conventions, the demands, and what we do as writers uh, for a more general audience almost I almost sometimes think it hurts me being a scholar. What happened all the time my first few years of writing was I would get this comment, that sounds really professorial. And I would say, well, what's wrong with that? Isn't it good to be professorial? But it was always negative, right? It was always like, you can't say that. That's too academic. That's too professorial. And it got me thinking, why is that something that one has to avoid? It's not that, you know, you can be a, an amazing, gifted scholar and, and you know, captivate writers. And yet you kind of have to find a different voice as a reader, as, as a writer for general audience. And I think it comes down to this, uh, as my editor, another editor once said to me, remember, a reader can always put the book down, a general reader. Your readers, when you write as a scholar, you can kind of just, you have free reign. You don't have to say it with polish. You don't have to say it with uh, elan. You don't have to say it with finesse. If you do, so much the better. But what you're really doing is you're producing knowledge. And that can be called for demanding syntax. That can call for you know, um, a, a style of writing in which literary pl pleasure isn't the end game. When you write for general audiences, you always are kind of on the reader's turf. It's, it's like, you know, if you're doing something that can turn the reader off, if the reader can kind of uh, tune out, if the reader sort of finds that going a little bit into the weeds, you're going to lose them. By the same token, if you, you can't just summarize academic writing and say, well, this is, you know, I'm going to take what I'm going to do and quote unquote, you know, not dumb it down, but repackage it for a lay audience. It's, it's different. You know, you, you have to be a storyteller a little bit for um, non-academic audiences. You have to know just the right amount to say and not go over that. Uh, it's really a kind of different voice. Now, I will say this. There is an in-between. If we created a Venn diagram of 
you know, academic writing and then public trade writing. The Venn diagram would probably, the platonic Venn diagram might be the New York Review of Books, right? Where you have an extremely uh, sophisticated, educated readership where you can kind of write at full tilt. Um, you don't have to make it, you can even put some jargon in, you know, because there's a lot of specialists who read that. But that's kind of sui generis. The two books that I wrote, you know, were were really not meant for um, the New York Review crowd, or they were more kind of a general, you know, the general serious reader. And so I was constantly directed by my editors, and I learned to um, develop as light a touch as possible when dealing with potentially uh, heavy scholarly stuff, but at the same time trying not to lose all the research, trying not to lose the ballast that comes with scholarly thinking. Mm -hmm. I hope that makes sense. Yes, it does. So we have a question about your daughter. And <laughs> the, que the question is, do you think that your daughter felt the emotional distance that you talk about early on? Or do you think having her surrounded by the love of your family gave you the time to heal without repercussion? That's a wonderful question. I think one thing that I learned very viscerally during that time, there were a lot of debates um, as, you know, this happened to me about the changing nature of the American family, right? You know, the old model of, of the traditional nuclear American family is, is, is changed. It's totally different now. And what I realized then is a family can be any configuration as long as it provides unconditional love. You know, my daughter was essentially raised by me and my 80-year-old mom, an odd couple, <laughs> admittedly. Uh, but she had had, we, I was one of six children. I also had five, old, five siblings, four of whom were older. They also helped raise her. So it, it really did take a village, a Southern Italian village, to raise my daughter. And I think their love was so deep that it insulated Isabel from the potentially traumatic aspects of it. And it did give me the chance to rebuild my own life. So I would say, you know, I'm not a child psychologist, um, but I would say that my intuitive sense is that the amazing um, outpouring of love from within my family and the night it happened in the hospital, you know, my mom is, is older now. She's, she was born in 1931. So now she's um, 89 years old. She had already. She was already in, not in good health. Um, she had all sorts of ailments. But she said that night, it was as my sibling said to me. She had decided she was going to raise this child and help me, and that was a heroic act. And they have an amazing bond. And I would say that what my family gave Isabel um, protected her from from the trauma and you know, uh, and gave me the space to kind of, to rebuild. Uh, the trauma I felt as, as, as things wore on was more about the challenges of fatherhood, even as, you know, as, as grief gave way to mourning over the, the death of my wife, it was more um, coming to terms with fatherhood. And that was the, the great challenge, but that's a great question. Thank you. So we also have a question, um, asking you for some words of encouragement for children of Italian immigrants who may feel alienated from their parents. <laughs> well, um, I wrote my book, My Two Italy's, because I was one of those kids. You know, I was growing up. I wanted to be American. I wanted, you know, I would go to the lunchroom. I wrote about in my book. My mom, now they're like delicacies where people pay, you know, $18 for these sandwiches. But growing up, my mom would make me these pepper and egg sandwiches on homemade bread and I'd open it up and the whole lunchroom would just smell them you know and I would be like can't she just make me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich like all the other American kids and of course the pepper and egg sandwich tasted much better mm -hmm. but there you have it you know I wanted to fit in and assimilate um I would say you know when I wrote that book I think it's very hard for us to see our parents as real people my dad was a very demanding and we loved him deeply. Uh, he passed away in, in 95. 
but he was he was a kind of tortured soul in the United States. You know, he worked 16 hour days. He worked in a factory, got up at 3.30 in the morning and then he worked as a landscaper after his factory shift. He was, he was, he was raising six kids on a laborer's salary. He was stressed and he was, you know, the, he, the, 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 the um, difficulty of life wore on him. And as I wrote my book, I said something to my mom um, she said, oh, you should have seen your father in Italy. He was so carefree and happy. He used to uh, serenade me. And it was like, I almost fainted. It was like the scales fell from, yeah. You know, oh, I never knew that person. And I realized, you know, my parents were human beings before they had me. And I started to look at the story from their perspective. And I realized as Americans of a certain generation, I know it's different now, but when when we immigrated, my family immigrated, the story was upward trajectory. You come to America, you work hard, you suffer, then your kids get an amazing education and go on to these very successful careers. A version of that definitely happened in my family, right? But we don't often think of what um, immigrants lose. You know, I remember I took high school, uh, Latin in high school, and immigrant, someone who goes towards somewhere, and an emigrant is someone who goes away from something. Every immigrant is an emigrant. And my parents, however poor their Italy was, they lost the land they loved. They gave it up for their children. And what an incredible sacrifice. Um, that is what I would recommend is think of your sacrifices that your, your family made. Think of their story, what they left not just what they went toward and how painful existentially it must have been to leave your homeland. That's what the divine comedy is about, about exile. You know, my parents experienced exile. They never lived in the country they were from. They never really learned English properly. And so I think that the book made me much more sensitive to um, a book that I love by W.G. Sebald is Emigrants. And it's such a heartbreaking book. Um, but he really captures that sense of going away from something instead of going towards something. So Dante has clearly been your guide and your touchstone and in so many ways in your scholarship and, and in the process of writing this book and, and since as well. Um, I wonder, what is it like as you speak about exile and you speak about return and the idea that it's very difficult to, to return and, and home is always changing, what's it like for you to come back to this book? Mm. Uh, as you speak about it. Um, so, is it different each time? Um, and, and it's such a tender book as well. Yeah. So do you feel that tenderness with, with each iteration? That's a great question. You know, um, I, I do. Uh, and it changes all the time. It's, it's almost like, I think of it as a reverse trajectory. You know, we think of scholarship, high level scholarship as sort of the deepest you can go into something. In a way, that's how I started with Dante, right? I started with him in graduate school. And then my first publications on Dante were extremely uh, deeply researched, very kind of in the, in the very, and Dante studies itself is, is a pretty traditional field. It's almost like biblical exegesis where you go through all the scholars who have said things before. And then I wrote a personal book. Now, and then I really, I've always teaching Dante pretty much every year. Now, to answer your question, I'm translating Dante because I want that intimate connection with the original language. And it's a totally different experience of reading him. I just translated a draft of the Vita Nuova and I'm starting to muddle my way through the, the early cantos of the divine of the Inferno. And it's been so humbling because Look, just by virtue of having spent a lot of time, you know, the Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours, I put in my 10,000 hours with Dante, and yet the language is really mysterious. Um, that intimate encounter with the language, uh, you, there's no way to get deeper into it than translating it. But I find, um, and my, my practice has been to just read it and translate it without consulting anything, the first draft, just that kind of one-on-one -on -one encounter. I'm realizing just how much is still hidden, you know, how much is inaccessible in the original language. And um, 
I never thought of it in these terms, but maybe the desire to translate Dante is that desire to kind of create a new level of intimacy um, that, um, you know, for me now, this, I had experienced as a scholar and as a memoirist, now it's really as a translator that that intimacy is coming through. So we have a question asking about um, your process in writing and, and your work ethic, and also um, how you tackle rejection as a writer. <laughs> to, to, to be a writer is to be rejected. Um, so that's a great question. Um, I'll tell you about um, a failed book that I wrote um, last year, was trying to write, and I thought it would be the easiest book of, of my career in a way, because I, I, after In a Dark Wood came out, you know, um, my plan was to go back to um, writing about literature, but I wanted to write about it in the gen for the general public as well, in the spirit of these two books. So I tried to write a book about literature for the general public. I tried everything. I tried every angle under the sun. I, I made it letters to my one of my daughters I made it a polemical book um, about way literature is studied and taught today I made it a how-to book every one of them failed and then at a certain point I said this just it's just not you know I think at a certain point um, to answer your question you always have to be open to rejection but you also have to admit when something's just not working it shouldn't be that hard you know, every book that I wrote and was published at a certain point just started, it starts to work and you can't, you can't will it. What I learned to, was two things. One, I think every book has an inner atomic clock. It will happen when it's time has come. I wanted to write My Two Italys back in the 90s when I started graduate school, and it was almost published in one form by an academic press. Thank God it wasn't, because it really came out in the right form in 2014 with a trade press. That was the right atomic clock for it. I think my literature book will one day come out when it's ready and when the form is revealed to me, but that's not now. Um, so you can go a little extreme in handling rejection, by that, I mean, well, all these versions of my book aren't working. I'll figure it out. Sometimes you got to read the writing on the wall and say, well, if, if, if people don't really, aren't really, if it's not resonating with people, uh, maybe there's something to that rejection. Um, so find a new book, <laughs> go write something else. And, <laughs> and the amazing thing is, you know, you take a step back and I think you see the book um, that you were trying to write for what it is. So, um, you know, you kind of have to have an iron will uh, in, in handling rejection. Um, but at the same time, I think you also have to be able to accept failure. I think that's um, hard for all of us, you know, especially as people who, you know, endured the attrition that scholarly writing can be. Um, we plow on at all costs, at all costs. But sometimes I, I'm, I think increasingly um, books shouldn't be that difficult if they, if they need to exist. So you mentioned that you're working on translation of Dante. Yes. Uh, is there also a, a current project, um, uh, more trade-oriented yes. project? Yes. So I'm, I'm glad you asked that because in a way, um, the, 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 the translation of the Vita Nuova is a project that I hope to come to fruition in the future, a future book. What happened in terms of the book that I'm writing on now is, um, again, things just like my Dante book. The answer came out of the blue, unexpected. I was struggling writing this literature book for the general public and why, we, why literature is important today. And I got a fellowship. I'd never expected to get it. Um, as much of a gift as the fellowship to the National Humanities was, Center was, I got a fellowship to go to Itati, uh, Harvard Center for Renaissance Studies in Florence. It just was this completely unexpected. I had applied without any anticipation of getting it. I got it. I packed my family up. We went to Florence for four months, and it was one of those life-changing experiences. 
um, we were living in the Renaissance for four months. If you've ever been to Itati, it's it's like taking a step back in past. It's um, Bernard Berenson, who was this 19th century art collector, built a shrine to Renaissance art in the hills of um, Tuscany. So I've been working on a biography for Princeton University Press of Dante's Divine Comedy. And that, that's a book that's really taking me years and I've been painstakingly building it up. And I, I, I worked on that book at Itati, but while it was there, I kind of fell under the spell. Um, I would go to the museums during the day. We were surrounded by all this gorgeous art. I fell under the spell of Renaissance art in particular, uh, in general, and Botticelli in particular, and this amazing set of drawings that he did of Dante 500 years ago um, that disappeared for 400 years. And they were discovered by a German art historian in the late 1800s, not really discovered, but sort of authenticated. And then I, I started to look at the history of these drawings and it was like a history of the, of the 20th century. The, you know, they, they ended up in Berlin during the Cold War, half of them in East Berlin, half of them in West Berlin. Uh, they disappeared after Botticelli's death. Botticelli himself was forgotten for centuries. The drawings were kind of rediscovered when the idea of the Renaissance was formulated in the 19th century by figures like Burkhart um, and Walter Pater and John Ruskin. So this gift of wanting to write a trade book and at the same time bring all my work as a scholar to bear dovetailed. And so the book that I'm writing now is the story uh, it's called Botticelli's Secrets, uh, The Lost Drawings and the Rediscovery of Italian Art, how Botticelli's drawings of 100, all 100 cantos of the Divine Comedy, you know, um, how they disappeared, they were rediscovered, and all their implications for contemporary culture today. So this is a project I'm so excited about because it'll be the first one that, you know, I'm writing for general audiences, but in a richly footnoted, a richly researched book that takes the scholarship, but puts it in the form of a narrative. So that's the, um, that's the project now. So I'd like to ask a final question. I, sure. I know you're familiar with Joan, Joan Didion's The Year of Magical Thinking. Yes. Uh, which is, a, of course, about the, the death of her husband and her experience of grief and, and recovery and, and uh, over that death. I wonder if you could talk to us about your own magical thinking a, a, a bit. I mean, are you eternally in magical thinking? Uh, what, what does magical thinking mean to you? Um, I actually quote, I have a very short quote in the book about that. I'll just, uh, yes. I was, li at one point I wrote, I was living under the spell of what one author, Joan Didion, called magical thinking the cool-minded craziness of those who expect their loved one back at any moment, ready to put on a familiar pair of old shoes. I knew that Catherine wasn't coming back for those knockout leopard print shoes she wore the night I met her in Williamsburg. Mine was a different kind of magical thinking, the sense that the world began and ended with my own suffering. My grief became an airtight shell, and contrary to the calm outward appearance I cultivated, my sorrow now defined me. Grief was choking my imagination, leaving me incapable of envisioning a different life. So I totally understand what she means by magical thinking. And this is how I would answer the question. For me, magical thinking was this strange space of being in, in the throes of guilt. And Freud calls guilt, uh, it's not guilt, I mean uh, grief. Freud, Freud calls grief this sort of invisible disease that no one can see. And as painful as it was, and it was awful, um, the morning was probably more difficult because then you're trying to get your life together. But the way I described it was, I said the air was electric. There was something heightened about that state for those years that I felt that. Um, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and a lot of bad and ugly. <laughs> But there was something of an intensity of feeling and depth. And just to give you an analogy, I'm a big tennis player. I've played my whole life. And I became even more obsessed with tennis when this happened. And the tennis court was like this space that I felt peace, where I felt, you know, um, uh, 
alone away from all the the surrounding chaos that my that a lot of my life had turned into and it this idea of the electric air i talked about this great historic wimbledon final between borg and mackinroe where every point seemed like electric you know and the crowd would yell because they were just so keyed up it just captured the feeling of grief as a time of hyper sensitized feeling that um and that's why i kind of felt i had to know i i had to write this book and it's even shocking and surprising to me when i go back and read it because as i said it really does feel like a different dimension of my life but um i can feel the feeling if that makes any sense i can feel what it felt like to be in the throes of it and you know, magical thinking is a strange term. It's eerie. It's not magical as in like wonderful. It's magical as in the sense of, you know, um, kind of this dark enchantment in a way. And um, electric air was was the way I, I described it. Well, thank you so much, Joseph Lutzi, for your beautiful and profound book and for this wonderful and stimulating conversation tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us for our virtual book club from the National Humanities Center. Please join us next Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock Eastern Time, April 29th, when Jane Newman from the University of California at Irvine will be discussing Boccaccio's Decameron. And if you'd like to learn more about the programs at the National Humanities Center, please go to nationalhumanitycenter.org. I'm Robert Newman. Thank you so much for joining us.